team Vadipa Naune in Daba. The time now is 14 minutes past 7 and you are locked on to Capitalk 100.4 FM. I can see many of you saying we are locked on and ready. We're waiting for the Honorable Minister. Well, he is here and we will be starting in earnest. Uh, so just to hold on as we get into the exchange. Good evening. This is the Deep Dive on Capitalk 100.4 FM and uh, we are catching up with the Honorable Minister of Home Affairs and Cultural Heritage. Uh, so do stay tuned. The number for you to lock on, send us your messages and to take part is 0719100404. We will also be live on Facebook. Uh, the link uh, will also be shared if you would like, but otherwise just log on uh, and take part in this conversation on tonight's edition of The Deep Dive. Capital 100.4 FM. Harare's Heartbeat. Now, as promised and much anticipated, uh, we are here with the Honorable Minister, uh, who is uh, Mr. Uh, okay, I, I don't even know if, if Mr. comes in. Honorable uh, Kazembe R. Kazembe. He's a Minister of uh, Home Affairs and Cultural Heritage. It is a warm, warm uh, good evening to you, Honorable. I thank you so much for gracing our studio and for being part of this conversation this evening. Uh, good evening. Now, we want to catch up with you uh, in terms of all the ins and outs of your ministry uh, and all the things that are attached to it uh, for the benefit of our listeners and more importantly, at the end of it, for us to be able to better interact with your ministry as citizens of Zimbabwe. So starting things off, can you unpack for us, Honorable Minister, uh, what is under the purview of your ministry, the Ministry of Home Affairs uh, and Um, the Minister of Home Affairs uh, has a number of departments under it. And I know the one familiar one is the ZRP, the Zimbabwe Public Police, <laughs> and of course the Civil Registry, you know, for obvious reasons. Um, then you have the Immigration Department, and we also have the National Museums and Monuments, you know, which takes care of your national shrines, you know, your museums and all the rest of it. And we also have the National Archives of Zimbabwe and the Lotteries and Gaming Board, the LGB. So basically those are the departments within the Ministry of Home Affairs and the Ministry of Home Affairs, the head office itself, which then, you know, presides over all these departments. So basically that's what forms the Ministry of uh, Home Affairs and Cultural Heritage. You know, the last one that you spoke <coughs> about, you know, is of interest to many and interest yeah. to me as well. Uh, the LBG. LGB. Uh, LGB. Lotteries and Gaming Board. Lotteries and Gaming yes. Board. Um, I'm very surprised that this falls under your ministry. Has this always been the case? And tell us what the, you know, what, what the Lotteries Gaming uh, Board encompasses. Well, it has, it has always been under the Ministry of Home Affairs. And it basically, you know, presides over the casinos your casinos, your sport baiting, you know, bookmakers, and all those, you know, um, baiting activities, they all fall under the Ministry of Home Affairs. And the LGB is the board that then licenses, you know, for you to be able to be, to be operating in this, in this sector, you need to be licensed. To, for you to open a casino, for example, you need to be licensed. If you even start preparing for a casino, you need to be given what's called an enabling license. In fact, let me take uh, advantage of uh, uh, this platform. Please do. To tell the citizenry that we have seen a number of casinos mushrooming without the, you know, the permission or rather the approval of the LGB. That is totally illegal in any language. So I would like to advise the citizenry or the potential investors uh, that should you want to venture into casinos, the starting point is you have to apply for what is called an enabling license, which then tells you or prescribes to you what's supposed to be done. As you then say you are building a new casino or you are renovating a building, you are supposed to be told what's supposed to be done and what's expected and as far as the law is concerned. So you get what is called an enabling license. Once you get that, and it's the board that does that, there are, you know, there are procedures to be followed, then you can now renovate your building or build whatever new, you know, you know, you know, set up. Um, after that, they will come and then inspect in accordance with the prescription they will have given you. 
and then they tick the boxes. And if you, everything is above board, it's okay, then you are given an operating license, and then you can operate. I've seen it. Now, the same applies to, you know, your, 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 you know, your, your betting, your, your, your whatever, your betting for the games and whatever it is. Again, you cannot just operate. You have to apply for the license. The LGB will come and inspect your premises and they prescribe to you what is required and then they can give you an operating license. And they continue to monitor because you have to abide by the laws. Because, you know, with gambling, you have to also protect the people who will be gambling, the clients, if you like. They have to be protected. So that's why you have to get a license. You are told the do's and don'ts and you also are monitored as you, as you operate. So, yes, that's what uh, encompasses the LGB. Very, very I, I, I get the feeling that that might have to be a standalone topic sure. for you to return, Honorable Minister. Yeah. But as we venture on in this conversation, please take us through some of the successes and achievements um, made by your ministry in, in, in recent years. Okay. Uh, and the What I would call our flagship or the most critical achievement, in my view, is the development of what we call the integrated ICT solution for home affairs. What am I talking about? That's an ICT system that attempts to integrate all these departments that I've mentioned digitally, you know, to interconnect them for interoperability. So what am I talking about? It means that ZRP is getting digitalized, or rather computerized. Uh, the civil registry, we've already started, I will probably give examples. The immigration is already being uh, digitalized or computerized. The LGB, uh, National Archives of Zimbabwe, National Monuments. So all these departments are being individually digitalized or computerized. And then after everything has been said and done, all those now individual systems are being integrated, connected, so that they speak to each other in real time. Once that is done, that's the integrated platform of the Ministry of Home Affairs. In my view, it's a game changer. Now, once that is done, now this new integrated plat platform will now be able to interlink with other stakeholders, your financial institutions, your, you know, your, your Zinara, if you like, your Ministry of Health. I'll get to that and how critical this is and how, uh, how it becomes a game changer in my view. So that is the biggest achievement. This has already been approved by cabinet. It's already operational. It's already being implemented, but in phases. Now, what does that mean? What do you mean the ZRP, for example? It has come up with what is called the Zimbabwe Republic Police Integrated Information System, yeah? which on its own, it integrates all the ZRP departments, yeah? meaning the crime management system, your forensic department, your vehicle, you know, uh, your, your traffic management system, all those, they are integrated into this uh, ZRP integrated system, right? That's on, on the one hand. You go to the civil registry, Kuzdupa, passports. That, again, they now have, they've already deployed what I'm talking about, what they call the Zimbabwe Population Registry System, they said, ZPRS. This is the heart system that then uh, the offshoots produce your, your produce your your passports, produce your birth certificates, produce your other uh, documents that come from the civil registry. So that's a, a, a computerized system on its own, called the ZPRS. Those are the individual system I mentioned earlier on. Now you go to the immigration. Immigration has also has also come up with what is called the online border management system. It's a computerized and integrated system that controls the border. And from that system, that's where you, got your, you get your e-visas. So now, all these individual systems are integrated. Now, what have we done so far? <clears throat> um, with the ZPR, it's already working. This is why now you can... In fact, one of the successes that I can probably, you know, at the risk of being accused of marking our own script, <laughs> we have uh, dealt with the challenges to a certain extent. We are not yet where we want to be. But I would like to believe that we've uh, done you know, term, tr relatively well in terms of the prov provision of passports, for example. I remember two, three years ago, it was the talk of, you know, talk of civil rights, talk of the Ministry of Home Affairs. We were insulted left, right, and center. And people had the right to do that because we, we really had challenges. Now, through the ZPRS, through the uh, digitalization of the, uh, the, uh, the civil registry, we can now produce e-passports, not just passports. You know, the president, uh, His Excellency President uh, Dr. Emerson Damuzumnangagwa told us that when you are rebuilding, rebuild better. 
If you're solving a problem, don't just solve that problem. Do it better. So instead of solving the passport issues, the backlog, which you, I, I'm sure you remember, we had more than 400,000, you know, passports in the backlog. You remember that? I, I don't want to remember. You don't want, yes. Okay, it's not belongs to history. It's okay. <laughs> so, but instead of just doing that, His Excellency the President directed us to do it better. So we to move towards now e-passport, which is the in thing, which is the latest technology. I'm not going, you know, I don't, know, I don't want to bore listeners by going in deeper into what an e-passport is and what it does. But there we are, probably one of the few c countries in Africa who can now offer an e-passport. And to also try and assist citizens, we are decentralizing these services. We've now opened districts, uh, op we've opened uh, registry offices, in not, in not in provinces only, but even beyond provinces, in districts. Namely, we've got one in Mazowe, we've got one new uh, uh, registry office in Gurure, in rural areas we're talking about. We have one in Murewa, actually. And beyond that, we have extended the e-passports even further down. We now have e-passports in Lupane, for example. We have e-passports in Gwanda, Bedbridge, Chitungwiza, Mazowe, Murewa, Kuruzeva. You know, after tilling your land, you can just wipe your sweat and go and get your e-passport and go back to the field, mm. which in my view is an achievement. Uh, now, <clears throat> can you to also, we, I know there's always been issues to do with uh, even birth certificates. And that was also, you know, we also had challenges you know, with COVID and all the rest of it. And also we had challenges with consumer boards. It used to be the talk back then. But now you will agree with me that we've done our best. The ministry has done its utmost to, 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 to actually bridge that gap to ensure that people have access to IDs. And to make up for the lost time during COVID, uh, we then had the mobile registration program where we targeted 2 million people. We had, after doing our own computations, we thought we had a backlog, a backlog of 2 million. But as we then went out, we actually issued 3 million uh, civil documents in that exercise to, cap, to, 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 to make up for the, for the lost time. In my view, that's an achievement. We're just talking about civil rights. I could go on and on. Um, then, as if that was not enough, just in preparation for the general elections, we are back with another mobile exercise to ensure that no one and no place is left behind. So we hope, to, we hope and trust that by the end of this exercise, <coughs> there will be no one who is supposed to have a, an ID who, that will be having no ID. That is uh, our objective. Now, I've spoken about the e-passport. I've spoken about decentralization of district offices. Now, we, the civil register as well is responsible for livestock branding. Um, and the ministry has also decentralized this function. It used to be only in Harare and probably Blue Whale, but now we've extended this to 32 more districts. So you can even have your, 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 your livestock brand certificates in, 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 in all these districts. Now, coming to the ZRP. I, I thought we were going to leave that one. You <laughs> want me to leave it? Okay. No, no not leave it, uh, mm -hmm. but to have, to have it as a standalone. Um, but of course, uh, if I can just come okay. in there. Um, I think before you even go on, allow me to do this. Rightfully so, uh, <laughs> as you go through the achievements uh, throughout your ministry. Um, now, if you're just joining us, we are reflecting and uh, catching up with the Ministry of Home Affairs, Honorable Kazembe Kazembe, right here in the studio on Capital 100.4 FM. Now, Honorable Minister, coming back to you, uh, mm -hmm. carrying on with the achievements, ZRP. ZRP. Yes. <laughs> Indeed. Well, I know that planning to say you know crime is on the increase but in my view um, I know the, the, the aspect of peace and security is very critical it's a critical ingredient as we develop our country as we develop our economy and in my view the ZRP has done its utmost uh, in the circumstances in maintaining peace and security you see the issue of peace and security in my view is like oxygen you don't realize its importance unless you don't have and until you don't have it when you now struggle to have it so when it's nice and good as it is right now you don't realize the importance of the police but it's what it is because of the work that they're doing we are in this environment because the of the work that we're doing i'll probably give another example it's like uh, you know the minister of health for example you may not really see its importance because you are healthy but you're being healthy is because they're doing something to ensure that you are healthy. So the same applies to the therapy. In my view, they've done 
quite a lot uh, in so many areas. This is why we have this, you know, this, uh, you know, you know, sanity in the country. You, you can't really compare uh, our country to other country or other jurisdictions in terms in terms of crime. Yes, it may have gone up, but again, also the other thing that I also noticed is that what's also changing is access to information because of technology. But if you look at the statistics, they're not going up that much. Yes, they are slightly increasing. In fact, the police had targeted to ensure that the increase in crime does not go beyond 7%. That was our target. But I'm, gl I'm glad and happy to say that they've actually managed to reduce it to 5.4%. So they've surpassed their target. So they've done, in the circumstances, they've done, they've done a lot uh, through police presence, through, you know, arresting culprits. You know, I know we've had a number of uh, armed robberies incidences, but a number of people have also been accounted for. A number have been arrested, and a number have attempted to engage in a shootout with the police. I want to take this opportunity to manner and language that you prefer. So I'm warning the citizens that uh, please cooperate with the police, but after everything has been said and done, I believe uh, police are doing such a tremendous job given the circumstances. Uh, they are doing a lot of awareness campaigns uh, and the Ministry is con conscious of the fact that c corruption is a sketch and the police are also doing their utmost. No one is above the law. We've arrested a number. I know people would say, but police officers are corrupt. Mm -hmm. Yes, there are some who may be rogue in my view and uh, the police is accounting for those. There's no one who is above the law. But I may also want to take an, uh, the, uh, you know, the advantage of this uh, platform to say the police one. The police will not engage in a corrupt activity individually without anyone. It takes two to tango. So I'm kindly asking our citizens not to engage in corruption, because co the police will not receive a bribe from from his own pocket, from the you know the left pocket giving the right pocket. There's somebody who will have offered them the bribe. So I'm saying to our fellow citizens out there that we have uh, we have a duty, we have a role, all of us. To eradicate corruption so if you say no everyone says no so who would the police engage engage you know with in corrupt activities mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I also want to take this this opportunity aspect um mm -hmm. particularly when it comes to zimbabwe republic police mm -hmm. um the uh, the grievance protocol or what happens when citizens have grievances we've heard sometimes of instances where someone perhaps is wrongfully arrested leading to a wrongful conviction uh, or in some time you know in some cases there's corruption and an abuse of process by officers uh, or, or some people within within that system um, how does your ministry deal with those issues well there are so many ways of dealing with that there's a hierarchy you know within the police uh, we do have uh, suggestion boxes but we also have different alternative, you know, uh, contact people that you can deal with. I give a very good example. Maybe the public do not know that. If you're, if if a police officer is, uh, if you feel we have been had, we have been had done by, uh, by a police officer, you can speak to their superior. You know, if it's an, it's an officer, or it's an officer in charge, there's a dispo, who's in charge of the district. If you're not happy with the dispo, there's a propo, who's in charge of the province. If you are not happy, you can still go to the Deputy Commissioner General or you can even uh, go to the Minister or the, to the Commissioner General himself. That's one route. But I'm also aware that there is the Independent Complaints Commission which is coming on board. That would be another obvious route that citizens can use. It has reached an advanced stage in terms of uh, you know the Enabling Act, uh, but uh, the Minister of Justice will be the right person to answer that. But I know it's coming uh, and it will be established very soon if it hasn't been established already. That's another route that our citizens can use. So there are so many. And also, besides, there's another easy route. There's the social media. If you didn't know, we look at that. We read that. And the, there's no smoke where there's no fire. So we, a number of people have been accounted for by just picking up something in the media, in the social media. That's the beauty of technology now. People can even say, in fact, I'm, I'm, I'm kindly aging citizens. Use your technology. Even if you, a police officer is asking for a bribe, just record in the quiet mm. and send it through to us or in the social media and we'll pick it up. We've got a team of people who are always looking at the social media to see what is happening. So that works as well. I can give examples of people who have been arrested after an incident has taken place on social media. There was a, I remember there was a time when uh, these touts, they mishandled or, or many handled an old lady 
and we saw it on video. It went viral, yeah. It went viral, and those people were accounted for. There's so many uh, incidents like that. Uh, I could go on and on, but social media works. Mm -hmm. yeah. And speaking of touts, um, um, so I was tasked to say, please say to the Honorable Minister, can the ZW through your ministry eliminate this menace? Mshika shika. Mm -hmm. it, it depends which menace are we referring to. Mm. Do you want to? Shika, the mshika mshika themselves to mm. say that they are continuing to operate with vehicles that are not roadworthy, they don't respect road rules. Mm. But I think I, I sort of see where you're walking me into. You're walking me into a <laughs> trap here because you're going to say, mm. uh, I hear you and I walk straight into that <laughs> one. Uh, but I think it's important mm -hmm. that maybe our listeners hear it from you. Okay. Well, that issue of uh, whether mshika shika are legal or not, it's actually under the purview of the Ministry of Transport who then either permit them to do what they do because remember police are there to enforce the law there's a difference between enforcing the law and being a regulator mm -hmm. so this issue of vehicles road worthiness and all the rest of it is actually under the purview of vid but however the police come in if called upon to do so by the by vid but again in my view some of this this reckless driving that's taking place is going to come to an end. Remember, I spoke about the integrated solution. In that solution, there is the electronic traffic management system, which is, which is a, which has already been piloted, which will consist of cameras in the major roads. So those cameras will be, will be the police officers. They'll be able to identify the traffic offenders. They'll be able to pick up the number plate and even identify the people who are driving and even find them digitally. So this is where we are going. I know when people are listening, they would think uh, the minister is just it's a talk show or it's on radio. But this is going to be real. You know, this is going to happen. We have, we are already, as a minister, we are already working with the Ministry of ICT to deploy these technologies. And a pilot project has already been done. And in fact, we are on information. We had this pilot project. I think it's still there. We still have a few cameras. I think I, I don't remember the actual intersections. And we deployed this system for only two hours. And more than 2,000 vehicles uh, were found guilty by the system. So we, d we believe that if we deploy this system, which we've already started working on, we are very advanced, it will be able to ensure that people behave on the roads. It will take a bit of uh, time in terms of uh, ensuring there's also the enabling law and in terms of the... Because remember, this system will then be linked to Zenara. Now, this is the beauty of the integration, this integration I'm talking about, because... Because internally, as Minister of Home Affairs, it will be interlinked within the department. So, if you commit a crime, you are driving, you drive through a red robot, the system will be able to pick up your license. And because the system, the integrated system is linked to civil, uh, you know, central vehicle registry, it will be able to tell who the owner of the vehicle is. But because the vehicle, the owner of the vehicle has been identified and the same system is linked to local government, uh, city of Harare, will be able to tell where you stay. Mm. You know, real time, real time. And that same system will be able to link you to the police to say this person has violated this offense. And because it's linked to the central registry, your life history will be able to be picked up instantly. These things will happen instantly without the interference of a human being, which again lessens the issues of corruption. Mm -hmm. So it's, it would need a week for me to explain this system. But I think in a nutshell, people now understand where we're trying to get. So that when we go technology, some of this behavior will be dealt with. Mm, mm, mm. Absolutely. How intriguing. And it does integration of all systems. We're here with the Minister of uh, Home Affairs and Cultural Heritage, Honorable Kazembe Kazembe, as he's shedding light on the achievements of his ministry, what's under the purview of his ministry, and more importantly, the future in terms of uh, operations, practices, and how everything will be done in real time. Um, now, as we continue on, um, Honorable Minister, uh, we are heading towards the plebiscite. The election season is upon us, and uh, um, His Excellency President Munangagwa speaks extensively against political violence. Mm -hmm. Help us appreciate the position of your ministry on political violence uh, in, in this very, uh, it, it's uh, the, the word, it's calmest before the storm, they often say. <laughs> I've got to begin with uh, the 
Excellency President Dr. Emerson Damuzi Mnangagwa, call against political violence. And in this regard, my ministry has directed the Commissioner General of Police to put in place robust strategies and mechanisms uh, to deal with political violence. We now have a Zimbabwe Public Police National Elections Committee, uh, which is working closely with uh, the Zimbabwe Electoral Commission and all relevant stakeholders to ensure that any case of political violence is dealt with without fear or favor. Uh, I also call upon our political leaders to be exemplary in their campaigns in order to assist the police in the maintenance of law and order in the country. Political parties must also notify. I know they think it's tedious, it's time consuming. Uh, you know, when they're asked to, uh, to, to notify reg regulatory, uh, uh, regulating authorities like the police, why we do this is because we need to know that you are going to hold this rally and the circumstances and the environment is conducive for you to hold that rally and if there's need to beef up with police we will do that if there's need to do preparatory work to ensure that the rally you know carries on or is held in a peaceful environment we need to know that so we encourage political parties to cooperate with the police so that we don't have any disturbances as they you know hold their rallies so as we head towards uh, 2023 i want to make it clear that ZRP will arrest all perpetrators, regardless of your political affiliation, your age, your weight, your, your height, you will be accounted for. So we are kindly asking our citizens to desist from political violence. I thought you were also going to add complexion. At the oh yes, <laughs> complexion by the way. <laughs> and hairstyle. And hairstyle. Yeah. Um, so a very stern all those who might incite political violence that there will be consequences um and now also just looking at some of the uh, the, the chances perhaps who mm. might you know think that i'll be able to get away with this and that because it's, it is political speech or uh or veiled under that well, what message would you have for them uh, as long as it disturbed the peace and tranquility in the country in one way or another by way of inciting others or otherwise you will be accounted for you will be accountable and the law will catch up with you very clear the honorable minister not mincing his words there if you're just joining us mm. we are catching up with the honorable kazembe kazembe minister of uh, home affairs and Affairs, uh, and uh, he is here, Home Affairs and Cultural Heritage, I beg your pardon, and he's live on Capi Talk as well as on our Facebook page. Honorable Minister, we also want to touch on uh, the aspect of the museums and the monuments. Mm -hmm. uh, we understand that we are in Culture Month. Uh, we had the privilege of speaking to the um, uh, director of the National Arts Council uh, just last week, who was telling us that, you know, they've gone a step further, and I believe working quite closely with your ministry, uh, to have a month uh, as opposed to a culture day, we've got a culture month now, which is throughout the whole month of May. Um, so looking at the role that is played by museums and monuments, um, there's often a, an air that there's not enough being done. As they say, they must pull up their sleeves. Uh, they, they leave a lot to be desired. Would you like to speak to that? I'm not so sure, but I, th I think what's, what's important is also to what cultural heritage is mm -hmm. so that we don't confuse it with active culture oh but, but please do yeah, active culture is what we're talking about okay. all this time mm -hmm. that's under the ministry of youth sports arts and culture and, 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 and recreation rather we are cultural heritage yeah the maintenance of heritage your museums your natural shrines and all the rest of it so what i'm not so sure of is what would the citizens want to see in that regard mm -hmm. which is not happening because I'll give a very good example. I believe we're doing our utmost, but there's room for, for correction. There's room for improvement. And we are, we are open you know, for, for, for advice or for recommendations or proposals. But in my view, we've done quite a lot. You know, uh, I could give an example. We've, uh, we just concluded uh, the construction of the Mbuya Nehanda, which in my view is very critical, Mbuya Nehanda statue. Uh, and currently we are working on the National Heroes Acre extension. Uh, is directed by the president. He directed us that we need it to be more, a bit more lively, and uh, there's a lot of work happening there. We are working with the Ministry of Local Government, and I know they've uh, they've, they've they've done quite a lot in that regard. They've come up with, uh, with uh, new designs to enlarge so that there's a bit more space and there's a bit more life and 
you know you've got some water features and all the rest of it so we are already working on that and we are also working on the poop monument you know the poop battle you know it's quite historic and we are we're doing something and we hope and trust that is is excellent the president we're going to commission that the same way he commissioned the Mbuyane and uh, statue and the Zimbabwe uh, the great ruins in Mashingo you know at one point the, the, excellent, the president signed an agreement with uh, the French uh, development agency who are assisting us to spruce it up you know to make it to give it life this is already happening as I'm speaking and we we just finished uh, redoing or spruce, sprucing up the Kamungo Mashrine in Mashringo uh, and again we await his excellence to go and commission that and we are also working on the Liberation War Museum which is going to be side next to the we, we know we've got the African you know uh, Liberation the Museum liberation, there's yeah. another one we believe we need to have our own which speaks to our own Liberation War without touching on other African states and that again is reached an advanced stage uh, the designs have already been done the site has already been identified and it's work in progress um, and also um, there's a lot of the Chinoy uh, 7 shrine again we're doing some work there so I'm not so sure uh, I know there's a lot that's supposed to be done this is why in fact, the other issue that was outstanding for quite a while which was dealt with by the Second Republic is that we went for a long time without a board a board yeah? which then drives this, this, this whole agenda and but now there's a board that was appointed it's unfortunate uh, the chairman is late, but uh, there's still board members who are running with it. It was now being chaired by the late uh, national hero, Brigadier General Kananga, but we're in the process of, you know, you know, finding a replacement. But there's now a board which is very active, which is now looking at, uh, and in that board, again, we are going to add a couple of more, you know, like war veterans, because we believe that they've got that emotional connection to, to shrines and they have to be part of this board. So, in my view, the National Museum has done quite a lot, but I'm not so sure what exactly maybe the citizens mm. expect so that we can improve. Um, well, perhaps to go a little bit further, um, you know, a question from a citizen who is asking, um, is it within the purview of your ministry to say if there's something historic, Absolutely. how do we then go about getting you know, the ministry to come and, you know, <laughs> declare it a national monument, uh, uh, that sort of thing. I think that's also okay. quite a, we, an important gap. It's very come. critical. We, we've had, uh, you know, and we actually welcome it. We are open to, you know, to, to, to people coming to our offices. They come to national uh, museums and monuments, uh, which is along with all their offices. And we do have also uh, offices in various provinces, uh, for the national museums and monuments so they can approach those and they'll be more than happy to come and collect that information they also do they've got archaeologists and all the rest of it it's not like if you tell them they'll just accept it but they'll listen to you and then they do their own checks but these people are trained they go deeper you know and interrogate and if it is indeed uh, an, an, a historic place then the normal uh, you know statutory instruments are done it's declared and then the government starts taking care of it and give starts preserving it, uh, giving it the preservation that it deserves. So we are more than you know happy to receive such information. We've got our offices very you know in various. In fact, just go to any Minister of Foreign Affairs office if you can't get to the national monument museums and monuments. But otherwise, we are we are very much willing to receive such information. Mm. Thank you so much, uh, Honourable Minister, for highlighting that. I think the important bit there was that there are people who come and then verify, yep. and then they do the digging. Interact with this ministry, uh, that could add value uh, to the Zimbabwean story. And, and I like that, maybe just for the avoidance of doubt, the difference between active culture and cultural heritage. No, heritage, you know, it's... Uh preserving the cultural sites, artifacts and all the rest of it. But the uh, culture that's active culture that now is under the Ministry of, of Youth. Important, mm. important. And thanks so much for clarifying that. Mm -hmm. um, now, there are issues that you talked about, Honorable Minister, around uh, immigration. Yes. Um, let's delve a little bit into okay. that um, in terms of uh, the mandate, as it were, um, that your ministry has, you know, in that department as well. Uh, and looking at the corruption, you know, I often hear statements like, they are porous, porous. 
and I don't know how those statements strike you, but but I would like for you to respond. We've done a lot in that regard. Remember, I mentioned uh, earlier on that uh, as a ministry through the Department of Immigration, we've been working on the on a system, an integrity system called the online border management system. You see, everything comes back to the integrated system I spoke about. That's the key. So, uh, immigration have already finalized uh, the procurement of the online border management system. What, what am I talking about? What is it? This is a system which integrates, which links all the borders, uh, you know, through technology, through systems, you know, operating procedures and all the rest of it. The technology will include, you know, like uh, smart borders, if you like, whether it's a road border, you know, or it's an airport. At the airport, for example, this system will come with what we call smart gates. Just as well, we now have e-passports. You see, we plan ahead. E-passports, they work well with smart gates. This is incorporated in the online border management system that's, where that's being deployed now. You, 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 you present your e-passport, and bef in fact, the whole system will also incorporate facial recognition cameras you come at the border before you even speak to uh, the corrupt person you're talking about if i'm to use your words um the system will be able to identify who you are and verify and check if in within the integrity system you uh, you have a visa if an e-visa or you're allowed or you're coming in you know legally before you even speak to anybody so you present your passport now to the gate to the to the to the passport reader at the uh, smart gate if all is okay the smart gate will auto open automatically without you talking to anybody now because this system has already checked your visa status and it's remember it's it's linked to the integrated home affairs system and also it's beyond that it's linked to the financial system to the tourism system what does it mean is now it now means the whole system now knows mr jokonia has now entered the country by just use of your biometric you know, characteristics, your biometric you know, uh, attributes, your face, or whatever it is, without talking to anybody. So the system automatically now, now you know, registers you as a visitor. And even the number of days you're you going to take. Regardless of which border you've used, Chirundu, Forbes, whatever, the system now knows you're within its, you know, its, 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 its purview. So your movements, even when you use your card at the ATM, your visa card, even if you, you swipe, you use those access cards at the hotel. But the entire system is integrated. It speaks to each other. It knows that you are within the country, uh, uh, within the, you know, the, the, your visa uh, prescription. Now, you stay one day longer. The whole system will shut up. You know, will shout. Your whole system is shut. You can't use your visa card. Because the system, the integrated solution system is linked to the financial system. Your visa card can't, can't, can't work because you have overstayed. Your card to open the door motel it can't work because the tourism sector is aware that you have overstayed by day, by a day you go across that electronic traffic management system the traffic light because there's facial recognition again it can tell that this person has overstayed that's how the online border management system will be integrated into this system what i'm talking about it may appear i don't know how like as if it's i'm dreaming but this is happening even if you go, if you go to dubai this is how it happens. Nobody speaks to you now. They only speak to us uh, if we are using the machine readable passports. But if you've got an e-passport, and in fact, they're now going beyond that. They're now going to a stage where you don't even have to present your passport. Just your face, you know. And now they've gone beyond facial, facial recognition. They are now using the, the iris. Because the iris will never change. Your face mm -hmm. maybe grow a beard and you look a bit different. Or you, you, my guys are not tricky, so you now look different. But <laughs> with true. the iris, it won't change. So as you walk into Dubai, your iris it picks you up. It picks you up and gives away all your history. Wow. And then as you walk to the gates, they start opening and you think they know you. No, it's the system that, that has recognized you that this is exactly where we're going. But we're doing it step by step. And in fact, we've already started started deploying these things. I know people, they go through the airport, at the Robert Mugabe airport. They think those cameras are for decorations. That is, has already been linked now to the police. They can tell as you come in that this person is wanted or not. Oh, this person yes, is yes, fleeing yes. anywhere into Absolutely. Paris. And because the online border management system is integrated with the ZRP, if you commit a crime, before you leave the country, as you walk out at the border, the camera will pick you up and connect you to the crime. So the, 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 the officers there will be able to tell that uh, this Jokonia has committed a crime there. So you can't leave. 
So this is where we are trying to drive. That's how. Now we spoke about the porousness of our borders. Yes. A lot is being done as well on that on that front. Uh, we have already acquired not just as Minister of Home Affairs but as Zimbabwe, the security sector. We now have drones that are already in use in certain areas, and even the issue of having the new border, the new. Um, uh, I don't know whether I've been to bed but you post. I haven't been to the new you need and to go there. one. You need to go there and see what is happening. The, the technology that has been deployed there by the Zimbabwean government, mm -hmm. it's amazing. Mm -hmm. And now from there, the government is, is, is we are now going to uh, Chirundu, we are now going to Forbes to do the same. That's how you are dealing with the border. The moment you do that, that one, you will improve the efficiency. Because you see, if the efficiency is not there, people tend to use other routes. Because it's not everyone who's criminal who uses another. But some people are just, they just want, you know, it's because of your inefficiency. <laughs> they don't want to be. So the new system that has been deployed at the uh, bed bridge border, it will deal with the efficiency uh, challenges. So in my view, that's the way uh, the issue of porous borders is being addressed through the online border management, the integrated system. And the future sounds bright. I'm hoping this is the near future, Honorable Minister. We would be very hard pressed to, to, to push you to give us a, a, a projection. When will okay. all these things start happening? I know you said some things are in different phases mm -hmm. of implementation. You see, with the technology, you cannot you know, have it complete on a particular date. What you can ask me about probably is, is it scalable? Technology has to be scalable. You know, you do this part today, when it improves, you go to the next level, and so on and so on. So we've already started deploying this system. I gave an example. The police, like for example, they, they already have the forensic laboratory, which is state of the art. You go to CID department, you see what is in there, you'll be shocked. The forensic department is already the cyber, uh, cyber department as well. It's already there with the latest technology on earth. You go there, you'll see it. And they are, I spoke about the traffic management system. It's just an advanced stage. We already have pi a pilot project in, in the city. Many people don't even see it. Talk of uh, immigration, they are, they've already finalized the procurement of online border management system. It will be deployed in stages. Now, talk of civil registry. I spoke about the, the Zimbabwe population registry system. It's already in place. This is why you now have your e-passport. Uh, and the ultimate objective is to ensure that you apply for a birth, birth certificate from the comfort of your home. And in fact, I, I'm sure you heard me talk about, or oh, it was actually Minister Mchangwa, when she was reporting about the outcome of the cabinet decisions yesterday. She spoke about... Uh, the live notification uh, of birth by the chiefs is part of this whole game I'm talking about. We are now saying when somebody, when a child is born, they should not go for a couple of days without being, you know, noticed that they've been born. They are now on earth. So the birth registry system starts right there. If they are in the communal areas, the chief must do that or the sub to be able to just, they'll be, uh, you know, they'll be capacitated uh, with that. Okay, for now, we're going to, we're using forms. But uh, going forward, we are hoping that they'll be having, you know, some, some gadgets that they can use, some, uh, you know, computer gadgets, you know, to, that they can use to log in the information and then it comes straight. What am I talking about? This system I'm talking about, the ZPRS, which we have already deployed, we're just now putting more modules will be able to initiate the identification of a child the moment the child is born. So it's going to be linked to the Ministry of Health. When I my, my birth records. My birth record. Birth record, yeah. Those yellow cards. Those yellow cards, yeah. Mm -hmm. But this Ministry of Health is also going digital. So the moment a child is born, there will be an active instant notification to the registry department. And and electronically and digital without the interference of anybody. It initiates the birth registry. So the whole process starts. Your your li your life tree starts there. So what will then be left is for the parents to give us the name. But otherwise the whole process will have started. So this is already in a, you know it's an advanced stage. The ZPRS has already been installed and the modules are being installed. So it'll be difficult for me to give you the exact date, but you you start seeing things happening. You know? Thank you so much, Honorable. And now I'm just gonna uh, messages that have come in from our listeners. So I'm just going to fish out three, uh, pose them to you, and then we'll wrap it up. Uh, this one is uh, more of uh, is, is give. This is giving. Uh, this is marking the honourable minister's script. <laughs> Mr. Taiwanda says hats off to honourable Kazembe. He's knowledgeable about every activity of his ministry. Uh, I don't know if I should read the last part. It then goes on to say some ministers are blank. I don't know who you're being compared to here. Uh, but, but I'll. Uh, 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 
uh, I'll leave it at that. Um, this one says, um, please, can you pose to the Honorable Minister that the state of our police camps are now undesirable? Uh, the police used to be, uh, these camps used to be lively and well maintained, uh, not to mention the verandas. They were great monuments. Please do something. That one is coming from Munyai. Um, and then this one uh, is saying, I really applaud all the work that all you ministries are doing in the new dispensation. And I hope everyone gets on board to build this nation. Um, they, this one says, how are e-passports different from ordinary ones that we're used to? Uh, and how do they improve process? Processes when one travels. I'd also like to ask um, some of the police officers are very conversant of the law because mm -hmm. I've seen some ordinary people having to interpret certain legal issues to them where they seem to have little knowledge. I've also seen this happen when they try to effect an arrest. So I think they're saying um, they need to be more conversant of the law. So a three part question there for you. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much followers for those pertinent questions and also let me start by thanking the other one who gave me a compliment or gave our minister a compliment. Absolutely. I salute that person. Okay. Um, the issue of deplorable police station, well, I can't agree with uh, with, uh, with you more. It's a fact. Uh, but we are seized with that. Uh, you know, we are coming from a situation where our economy was not doing well because of obvious reasons which I don't want to get into. Uh, we had a lot of challenges and came in came the new dispensation. You'll agree with me that there's a lot of things that the new dispensation has done yeah. under the leadership of the president. Uh, so we are coming from a situation where we were actually going downhill and then we had to stabilize the situation, the economy rather, uh, using, you know, the stabilized, the, what do you call it, TSP? Yeah, Trans the transitional, transitional stabilization policy. We had to stabilize. It was, let me give you a very simple example. Let me be a bit dramatic. It's like you've got a, a wound, you've just been cut, and you are bleeding. And if not checked, you can bleed to death. Now, what you have to do first is to stop the bleeding. You stop the bleeding first, and then you, you heal, you try and, you know, deal with the wound, and then it starts healing. It's a process. So we were bleeding. So we had to stop the bleeding through the transitional stabilization program. Now, once you stop the bleeding, the healing comes. So now we are now healing. That's why you see the changes. That's why. So we had reached a stage where indeed our police stations, I agree, they are not in a good state, but it's, a, it's an issue that the government assists with. That's why the president, the, along the way, established the Ministry of National Housing. That was the very reason to deal with institutional housing. It's not just the police. Uh, it's probably the most of the civil servants and I'm sure you can agree with me now that you've seen some complexes coming up the president has been commissioning uh, you know the, these housing you know programs so yes there's a there's an issue but the government is seized with that and in fact recently I think it was uh, yesterday in yesterday's cabinet or the, the previous week where government approved the use of the latest technology building technology so that we can fast track this uh this these programs of building accommodation the new technology now you can build 100 houses in the very shortest you know possible time so all these interventions so i appreciate what the, the listener highlighted but we are dealing with it uh the minister of uh, national housing uh, minister garway has been directed to deal with institutional accommodation whether it's uh, you know residential or uh, office accommodation but it's an issue that we are, we are offering it. And it, it definitely needs to be attended to. E-passport. There was a question about how different is the e-passport from, from the ordinary, ordinary passport. passport. It's yes. very different. Mm -hmm. The ordinary passport, it has got all your credentials, or all your, 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 your data, rather, on the data page. You have to read it. And of course, it's got a lot of few security features that you have with your infrared. But the e-passport is very different in the sense that everything is embedded in a chip, in an electronic chip. There's an electronic chip which is read electronically. When you present your passport, all your details, including your face, your fingerprints, are read off the chip, which you can't do with ordinary eyes. Now, if you are now going into developed countries, the person asked about how does it help us. I'm sure if you've traveled to, for example, UAE or even the UK or in the States, you'll find there's, there are smart gates, smart gates for smart people with e-passports. Then there's the ordinary gate 
for those with machine readable passports where you now have to be scrutinized they have to read they have to do with an e-passport the passport speaks on your behalf you present it and all your data your face is you know is, is um, processed within a fraction of a second and in fact where we're we going now the people, our citizens will see the, the beauty of an e-passport i spoke about where UAE, UAE is a bit advanced when it comes to these things how you'll be able to enter i've seen these things when i've been, I would, I've been exposed to them where you enter uh, when you enter into the airport you are going to get to a stage they're, they're already piloting this you don't talk to anyone you go in there as you go in there your 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 currently we're using the e-passport where you present it to a, to, a, to a smart gate and then the, the gate opens automatically you see those things those those gates opening automatically and then you walk in and then everything else happens but where we are going now there will not be even need for that e-passport because the you can't like i said you can't change your iris you can't change your some of your physical you know characteristics you can't change your attributes you can't mm -hmm. so that will be your passport because everything will be interconnected integrated electronically you get a visa elect electronically as you walk in everything happens in, you know instantly without you knowing what's going on so th that's the that's where we are going so if you have an e-passport what will be Mm. I like that smart gate for smart people with smart passport. <laughs> this one, uh, I know I said those are the last questions, but I think I'll squeeze one more in. Sure. Uh, this one says, Honorable Minister, concerning civil registration, Kujutupa. Mm -hmm. They say they take a specific number of people per day. Mm -hmm. Is this in their mandate? And they also say, does the Honorable Minister also... Uh, is, go, is he going to extend the integrated systems to VID okay. uh, because wow there is a need there okay um, talking about IDs we are seized with that this is the idea is to decongest the offices where people go and apply for their IDs that's why we are saying if you heard me when I started the starting point is to ensure that when a child is born the process of getting his, his or her ID starts as soon as they, as they come to earth through live notification. That way, the process starts without anyone going to the offices, to the civil, to the district offices. So we've already decongested. Because right now, if you go to Macombe, you probably see hundreds of people wanting birth certificates of children who are probably at now at the school going age. We are trying to avoid that. We are saying, let's start with Zotangira. Manaji was Jarwa. We now want a system. You're going to tower. My dear, because you want a birth certificate, automatically you are given an IT number by the system. This is where we are going. And eventually, we want a situation where, even when it comes to passports, we don't want people there. We want you to, once it's fully operational, we want you to apply from the comfort of, from your phone. You must only go there to get your fa your picture taken. Just once. You, 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 there's an appointment set for you. That's the whole idea. So, yes, we are aware. We are, we are not, this is why I, I said, we might have done a, you know, relatively well, but we are not happy as yet with the IDs, even the birth certificate. That's why we are trying to go digital. To, it won't happen overnight, but as we go along. And also decentralization. We are trying to decongest these provincial centers and the, your Harare, your Blue Whale. That's why we've opened offices in districts. And we are continuing. We still have a big, a long, a big program. Uh, all these efforts, we are trying to ensure that citizens have easy access to identification documents. Because it's a right, it's a human right. Absolutely. Honorable Minister, we have... Oh, there was the VID. There was the VID question No, no, that well. VID now, yes. Remember, I, I said the integrated solution will be linked to stakeholders, to other uh, departments and, 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 and ministries. Zinara is one of them, VID. But already VID, I'm sure I've heard Minister Mona telling me that they are also deploying because we've got a whole of government approach. When I'm talking about these things, I'm not just doing them alone. We are also talking with other ministers. Because at the end of the day, if we are to fully embrace e-government, every ministry must come on board for interoperability. So yes, VID are also digitalizing. And at the end of the day, these two must link. The other advantage of an integrated solution is that you don't have to keep asking a person the same questions. You, you, you go to VID, you go to every, you want to open a car, in a car, start a company, they say, no, 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 no. All this information must now be at the National Data Center, which was commissioned by the President. This is where we are going. We already have a National Data Center. So all this data that is collected must go there, must be deposited there. Any minute that wants it, as, you, as soon as you walk into an office, they should be able to get that information at the click of a button. You want to open an account, there's no need for you to fill in all those long forms. If we go 
digital if we are integrated and the key word for this entire interview was integration yes. absolutely we fast run out of time honorable minister immensely mm. for allowing us into your ministry for explaining so comprehensively what the future looks like and exactly what is under the purview of home affairs and cultural heritage now as we close off your parting shot to the citizens listening i know there's many questions <laughs> that were not answered uh or that wanted to be posed mm. but uh, to the citizens listening uh in closing what do you have to say honorable uh, first and foremost i would like to elections uh, please uh, let's heed the call uh, by the president his excellency dr idim nangagwa that in a big no to political violence this is our country we may differ you know politically uh, but we are still all zimbabweans this is the only country that we have so whilst we differ politically but let's remain patriotic let's love our country uh, and let's ensure that the elections are peaceful uh, and uh, we continue to love each other I want to attend us, Honorable Minister. Thank you so much for being our guest this evening. That's Honorable Kazembe Kazembe, Minister of Home Affairs and Cultural Heritage, who was in the studio with us. To all of our listeners who are joining us on Facebook platform, thank you so much for all the engagement and for staying locked on. This has been The Exchange on Capitalk 100.4 FM. The Exchange.